Okay. Please find, uh, find seats. And we're going to resume. The, uh, we have left uh, one talk, and then we're going to have a panel discussion. And I'm pleased to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Lawrence Friedman from the Gertner Institute for Epidemiology and Health Policy Research. And he's going to speak to us on concepts and challenges in combining dietary biomarkers with self-report in nutritional epidemiology. And he's going to begin with a short plug for the uh, excellent conference which we have on tap for Tel Aviv next year. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, David, and uh, the organizers for inviting me. It's wonderful to have Marvin and uh, Thelma here, and uh, they should return here many times. Um, this is just to give you, as, as uh, David said, it's a plug for a conference that we're organizing in April 2013, uh, from the 22nd to the 25th of that month. And I know it's uh, very unusual in Israel to be planning so far in advance, but uh, uh, I want you to keep the dates available so that you will be able to come along, and it's here in Tel Aviv on the beach. Okay, uh, I need to close this and go on to the talk. So, so if you just bear with me, I'll get the uh, pointer up and so that I have a pointer that I can use. There we are. Okay. Um, so as you see, I'm going to be talking about the concepts and challenges in combining dietary biomarkers with self-reports in nutritional epidemiology. And um, I've been working with uh, several, many people in the National Cancer Institute and other parts of the United States uh, on this. And I particularly want to mention Arthur Shatskin, who is an epidemiologist uh, who was very, who's been really a uh, front runner in nutritional and epidemiology for many years, uh, who I collaborated with. And unfortunately, uh, he passed away a year ago, and we're still missing badly. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is to um, uh, talk, give you some background and then go into the main problem. So the background starts off with, of course, we're very, very interested um, in um, measuring dietary intake, what we eat, and relating this to our health and, particular, and to particular health outcomes. Um, and there are many different types of studies uh, in chronic disease prevention which have been used to do this and the three main types are case control studies, cohort studies and randomized dietary intervention trials. Um, and uh, these will have their pros and their cons. Uh, the case control studies are inexpensive and quick to do relatively but their results are subject to confounding and they have several uh, specific biases to this design such as recall and selection bias. The cohort studies are more expensive. You have to follow the individuals up for several years after you've recruited them. Um, and the results are also subject to confounding, but they're not, they don't have recall or selection bias in them, so they have some advantages over case control studies. And the randomized studies are very, very expensive, comparing different uh, diets that uh, people are told to eat. Um, the results are, are not subject to confounding, but because of their expense, there are very few of them, and we can only look at very selected questions. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about cohort studies today, um, and this is an example of one particular cohort study called the NIH AARP Diet and Health Study, which was actually run by Arthur Shatskin. Um, and one particular analysis I'm going to be talking about includes 188,736 women. Why so many, I'll be talking about. Um, and uh, fo followed up for several years and uh, with 3,500 uh, breast cancer diagnoses. Um, so we're talking about large studies, but I'll come on to why in a minute. Um, the uh, dietary intake that we have to measure when we relate diet to our health outcome has been mainly measured through self-report instruments. And the main instrument that's been used to date is something called the Food Frequency Questionnaire. I'll show you a page of that in just a minute. The trouble is that the results from such studies 
cohort studies using uh, this instrument have been inconsistent and there's been a failure to find evidence for apparently strong hypotheses. For example, there's a strong hypothesis that dietary fat is related, uh, associated with the incidence of breast cancer, but uh, these studies have not shown it. Um, of course, the hypothesis could be wrong, that's another possibility, but uh, uh, there's doubt about it. And there's constant doubts about the accuracy of the measurements from such instruments, and this could possibly explain um, why we're not being able to pick up these signals. Here is a food frequency questionnaire, and just to give you an idea of its uh, complexity and how difficult they are to complete. Um, this is a page on fruits, uh, page four, you'll see just at the top there. Um, and here we have a whole list of fruits and, veg fruits and vegetables, excuse me. And um, on the columns, you'll see the frequencies that you have to report on average how much you eat of this over the last year. Um, now read the instruction on the side just to see how difficult this is. It says, please try to average your seasonal use of foods over the entire year. For example, if a food such as cantaloupe is eaten four times a week during the approximate three months that it is in season, then the average use will be once per week. Now you have to go through that calculation, have all those data in your head, and it's even difficult for a statistician. So we have, so we, this is a, a problem, so I'm going to be talking about um, the problem of dietary measurement and the, error, the, the effects of errors uh, in our dietary reports uh, uh, on the results of studies. Uh, so our setting is going to be a cohort study of diet and disease, and to make things simple, we'll, think, we'll assume that we're going to be investigating a logistic regression model the log of the odds that y, some health outcome variable, which is binary, is equal to 1, equal to these things here. Now, t is the dietary exposure that we're in, really interested in, and we'll assume now that it's the true usual intake, not something that we've measured. And um, these z's are exposures, confounders, effect modifiers, or intermediate variables. And in fact, I'll be talking uh, quite a bit about intermediate variables in this talk. Um, I don't know what's happening now. Ah, the alphas in this model are the log odds ratios for the expansory variables. And the one that we're going to be most interested in is this alpha t. It's the risk parameter of interest, the risk parameter related to the dietary intake. Okay, so as I said, our problem is that we can't measure t exactly. And instead of t, we get a report, which I'll call q, for questionnaire, which measures t with error. And it's well known that if we use Q instead of T in the regression, then two things, two problems occur. Firstly, the estimate of alpha T, the parameter that we're really interested in, is factored down, gets attenuated. And the second one is that the study power is decreased. And these problems are caused because we're essentially losing information about what the usual dietary intake is. Um, and this loss of information is caused by the measurement error. Uh, this is just to give you an intuitive uh, feel for why we get attenuation of the uh, risk parameter that we're interested in. So the T's here are the true values of some intake. And you can see that here in this uh, slide, the uh, line represents the slope, the relationship between the health outcome and the fat intake. So we have a slope here. When we, when we, we can't measure T, we get Q instead. Q is T with some sort of error. And, uh, uh, and the error is random and, and uh, is not a constant for every individual. And because of this randomness of the error, we get a shallower slope, and that is the attenuation. Okay, apart from that, as I said, we lose statistical power, and um, there's some simple uh, statistical methods that we can use to show that the effective sample size that we get in our study if, it's, uh, if we're entering n people, is actually to reduce it to rho squared times n, where rho is the correlation between the questionnaire and the true intake. Um, and this, um, this means that you think, uh, if you were under the impression that you were measuring that uh, exactly, and you had entered n people, you'd be under a false apprehension because the measurement error means that, in a sense, you're really only entering row squared times n. 
And the rows, the correlation coefficients, have been shown in validation studies to be really quite low. So here's uh, some results from a large validation study which was, uh, which was conducted where it was, they were able to show that the correlations for energy were as low as 0.2 and 0.1, for protein a bit higher. For protein density, which is the ratio of protein to energy, a little bit higher still. But these are not, um, these are not terribly good correlations. And if we then apply this formula um, to, that, uh, to how many people we need to achieve a certain power, well, if we needed 10,000 people in a cohort study, and this is often the case because we're talking about rare diseases such as breast cancer, um, uh, and so we might need as many as 10,000 individuals if we could measure the di dietary intake exactly, Without uh, measuring exactly, having these questionnaires, these are the numbers that we would actually require to get the same power. So the lowest here we see is 54,000, and it goes up to a million in that case here. Um, so one thing we could do is actually to increase our sample size. And the question is, does that alleviate the problems entirely? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Even that doesn't alleviate the problems entirely. And the example I want to give is from this study here, which uh, again you'll see Arthur Shatskin's name at the end, uh, comes from that cohort study I just mentioned, and it's a paper about the, the relationship between dietary fat and invasive breast cancer in postmenopausal women. And here are the results, and I want you to look at the third row, this row here, the energy-adjusted energy hazard ratio. Hazard ratio is like a relative risk, and you'll con you can see that as the quintiles, these are quintiles of uh, fat intake, and these are the actual values, the median values within each quintile, you can see that as the, as the fat intake increases, the relative risk tends to go up. And it goes up, not by very much, but it does go up. And the, because the numbers of breast cancer cases are so large here, we have a statistically significant result. So you might think, ah, oh, wonderful, these, this, uh, where, this uh, device of running really large studies uh, it gives us, uh, gives us really clear answers. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not, that, it's not the case. Because in the discussion, the investigators noted something very important. Sorry. Uh, that unmeasured or incompletely ascertained confounders could have influenced the results. Um, and the, pro the problem is this, that when we have, an un we, we have a cohort study, an observational study, we have uncontrolled confounding. There's always some confounders that are present but we don't take, aren't able to take account of them. And um, it's, in that way, it's different from randomized clinical trials. Um, we, in randomized clinical trials, we just have random noise that we have to worry about, uh, but we don't have uncontrolled confounding. Uh, in these studies, we do. So in order for the risk estimate to be uh, really um, uh, recognizable, it has to dominate the noise due to random variation and the uncontrolled confounding as well. So the sample size can reduce the random noise. And unfortunately, though, the sample size, by increasing sample size, you can't, reduce, you can't get rid of the uncontrolled confounding. And so that's why with these low relative risks that you saw in the previous slide, the investigators had to say at the end, well, these are the sorts of relative risks that could be created by uncontrolled confounding as well. And, um, and so we're at an impasse. What can we do about this problem? So the only way, other way of overcoming the problem is to measure dietary intake more precisely, and this will lead to less attenuation, a larger relative risk, as well as greater power. Okay. Um, a little bit more background. When people do these nutritional epidemiological studies, they use methods to try and de-attenuate the, uh, the relative risk parameter, this estimate of alpha T. We get a value that's too low. There's a way of trying to, of trying to make it, re-inflate it to get to the right uh, value so that it's unbiased. And this method, the most commonly used method, is called regression calibration. And the idea of it is instead of putting the Q, the questionnaire value, into the logistic regression, we put something else in instead. And this something else is the expectation of the true intake given the 
Q, the questionnaire, and the confounders. Um, and you can think of this value as being the value of the true intake that we predict when the report is Q and the other explanatory variables are Z1 to Zp. So it's a sort of prediction equation. Where we get it from is validation studies, um, and I'll say a little uh, something more about that later. Um, so it's very useful for doing this de-attenuation and giving you unbiased estimates of, of the risk parameter that you're interested in. But the problem is that it doesn't, uh, or makes very little change, or no change at all, to the result of the null hypothesis that the log odds ratio is zero. In other words, it doesn't increase statistical power. Um, and the reason that it doesn't increase statistical power is because usual regression calibration uses exactly the same information Q about dietary intake as, as the unadjusted method. We're not adding any extra information. We're just manipulating our estimation methods to get us an unbiased result. So what we have to do is to add information about what the true intake is. And what I'm going to be talking about today is using a dietary biomarker to do that. So the dietary biomarkers in general, what are they? Well, they're any biological measurement that can be related to dietary intake. Um, most of them are subject to complex metabolic pathways in their regulation. And so they don't provide unbiased measures of intake. We can't tell exactly what someone's eating from that, but they are at least correlated to the level of intake of particular, um, particular nutrients. Uh, so examples of them are serum carotenoids, serum lipids, serum vitamins, things that are found in the blood which relate to what we eat. Um, they could be useful for recovering this lost information about usual intake, increasing the signal, increasing the precision with which we uh, measure dietary intake, and recovering the lost statistical power, and that's what this talk is about. So instead of looking at considering using usual regression calibration, we'll consider using together with the questionnaire Q a dietary biomarker M. Gonna, uh, that's the letter that I'm going to use to denote the marker. In other words, we'd like to use the expectation of true intake given the questionnaire value, the marker value, and the, and the, uh, and the confounders. And we'll call this, having added in the marker, enhanced regression calibration. Um, however, its use is not completely straightforward. And we have to carefully consider the relationships between the intake, the biomarker, and the health outcome in order to do this properly. Uh, so the reason we have to do that is, firstly, it's not completely clear uh, how to estimate the risk parameter properly once we've introduced this biomarker, so I'm going to be talking about that. And also, of course, we need to know about these relationships when we form the calibration equations, these prediction equations for the true uh, dietary intake. So here is a, um, uh, a diagram which uh, specifies what are the causal pathways uh, in, in this problem. So we'll start off, to explain this, we'll start off with true dietary intake. And here, in the, you can see in this pathway that we are considering two different uh, ways that dietary intake might affect the health outcome. First is this direct pathway, and the second one is through the biomarker itself. Okay, this is called the direct, and this is called, this, the first one's called the direct, the second one's called the indirect. So that's one set of relationships that we're going to have to consider. Um, in addition to that, we have confounders, which, might affect, which affect the health outcome and might affect either the true biomarker level or the true dietary intake. And in addition to this, we don't actually see these values of T and MT. What we do is get measurements. And so this is the uh, reported intake from the questionnaire, and this is the actual measurement in M in the laboratory of this true value. So uh, what are the main assumptions in specifying these models? Um, firstly, that dietary intake causally affects the biomarker level. That's an important assumption. Secondly, that the biomarker level may at least partially mediate the effect of dietary intake on the disease. And thirdly, that the main confounders, 
unknown and measured exactly. And of course, like every epidemiology problem, if you don't capture the main confounders, then you're always going to be uh, sus subject to uh, biases in your estimates. Okay, so um, these, that, that model that you just saw before, the graph, actually um, includes four different statistical models. And these are them written out here. First, we have a logistic regression model relating the health outcome to true intake T and true biomarker M together with confounders. Secondly, we have a relationship between the marker and the true intake. Uh, with maybe some confounders in that as well. And then we have two measurement error models. This one is for the report, uh, reported intake, the questionnaire related to the true intake. And this last one is for the measured biomarker. And here we're assuming a classical measurement error model where the measurement of the biomarker is simply the true value plus some independent error. Okay, these models, which I've just shown, are actually, you can see them as part of uh, the graphs here. Uh, so the first model is, uh, includes all the arrows that uh, arrive, oh dear, arrive at the health outcome Y. Uh, so we have three arrows, and they correspond to the three terms in that logistic reg regression model. Um, I'm sorry, have I, where am I? Ah, there, should be there. And you can see the coefficients of the alphas um, uh, can, for each of those terms. And this is a similar thing for the marker intake model. These are the two coefficients in the mar marker intake model, and you can see which part of the graph that refers to. And this is the reported intake model. And finally, we have the classical measurement error model with the coefficient of one for the measured biomarker. Okay, the next question is, what do we actually, having introduced the marker, what do we actually want to estimate and test? Which effect are we interested in? And um, this is just the part of the graph which deals with the dietary intake and the marker and the health outcome. And uh, you can see, as I mentioned before, there are two different pathways, um, and each one has a separate effect. So this pathway, what we call the direct effect of diet on disease, uh, has a coefficient of alpha one, and this one, the indirect pathway, uh, actually includes two the two different models, the intake marker model uh, and the, also the health outcome model. And um, this, the effect, the sum effect of this indirect um, uh, 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 pathway is gamma 1, this coefficient, times alpha 2. And then the total effect of the, of the diet on disease is really what we want to estimate, because that tells us what happens if we change our diet from, by one unit, say. And uh, that's the sum of these two. And that sum is actually the same thing as the alpha t that I put up in previous slides. Okay, so when there's no measurement error, there's a very simple way of measuring alpha t, and that's just to forget about the biomarker completely. Drop it from the model, because it's a mediator, we don't really need it, and uh, we can estimate alpha t directly. But um, because we have measurement error, and we want to use the biomarker in order to improve our estimation of true dietary intake, we, uh, we can't do that uh, directly. Uh, but here are three methods of estimating alpha t which use that idea of dropping out the biomarker in some sense. The first one is the unadjusted method, the usual way that we would do these things. We regress health outcome on the questionnaire and the confounders, so we call that the unadjusted method. And then we have the second one, one I already talked about, the usual regression calibration, where we regress health outcome on this expectation of T of the true intake, given the questionnaire and the confounders. Um, and the last one is the enhanced regression calibration that I mentioned earlier, where we do the prediction using the biomarker as well as the questionnaire. So one question that comes up straight away is which of these methods is unbiased? And um, we know the first one really is not unbiased. It's only unbiased if Q has no measurement error, and we know that Q, the questionnaire, always has measurement error in it, so it's a biased estimate that we'll get. 
and, and that's the attenuation that I was talking about earlier. Um, regression calibration, uh, we know from theory, is unbiased as long as the measurement area is what's called non-differential. That is, essentially what we're saying is that if, if you knew the true intake, the extra information that you get from the questionnaire doesn't tell you anything more about the disease. Okay? Uh, so Q, conditional on T, is independent of uh, the health outcome. And uh, as a result, regression, this is one of the conditions that regression calibration works successfully and produces unbiased results. What about enhanced regression calibration, this new thing that we want to do? Well, unfortunately, it only gives you unbiased estimates if the marker does not mediate the effect of that uh, at all. That is, that co coefficient which go went from the, from the biomarker to the disease, from MT to Y, if that's zero, then you're okay. You get an unbiased estimate. But if it's not zero, which in the most cases it will not, probably not be, um, it, you have bias in this uh, method as well. Um, and the reason is that as, as soon as there is mediation, this assumption of, um, uh, uh, that we, was used in regression calibration, uh, that the marker is independent, uh, the marker conditional on the true intake is independent of the outcome, the health outcome Y, no longer holds as long as there's me when there's mediation, and that creates this bias that we get in this estimate. So you might think, why are we doing this at all? Um, well, let's go on to the next question. You'll see why we're doing enhanced regression calibration. And that involves the question about testing the null hypothesis of that there is actually no relationship between the dietary intake and the disease. Uh, so apart from estimating the odds ratio, we want to test whether this, uh, odds, this log odds ratio, alpha t, is equal to zero. And um, the, all these three methods of estimation actually lead to a test of this null hypothesis. It's a very simple wall test. We take the estimate, we divide by its standard error, and we compare it with the standard normal distribution. So the question arises, well, which of these tests is valid? And um, that is, which of these tests yields a these, these methods yields a test that has the correct probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. And the strange answer is that all three of them are okay for testing the null hypothesis. And the reason is, is because of this. You might have thought that the unadjusted method and the enhanced regression calibration method wouldn't give you a valid test because they both produce biased estimates of the alpha t. But it so happens that when alpha t is zero, all three of them are unbiased. And because all three of them are unbiased when alpha t is zero, they give you unbiased tests, valid tests. So the next question to ask is, well, if all of them give null, tests of the null hypothesis that are valid, which one is the most powerful? And the answer from theory and simulations, which I won't show you today, is that the enhanced regression calibration method is the most powerful test. So what I'm going to do now in the time remaining, I'm not sure how much that is, um, is to um, talk about uh, an example where we applied the, this method. Uh, it uh, comes from a study called CARIDS, or Carotenoids in Eye Disease Study, which uh, was a study to examine the relationship, uh, hopefully a protective one, of carotenoid intake uh, to eye disease. It's an ancillary study of the Women's Health Initiative observational study, and there were 800, 1,802 women recruited to CARIDS during the period 2001 to 2004. And the disease of interest I'm going to talk about is the eye cataracts, um, which are defined in this study according to an eye examination which was done, uh, plus reported previous treatment for cataract by the patient. So both of those were done, and uh, if either was positive, they were, called, they were um, classified as having cataracts. Um, the dietary intake of interest comes from a food frequency questionnaire, and the carotenoids that are really of interest here are lutein and, and zeaxanthin. These are two carotenoids which actually concentrate in the eye, and that's uh, why they're of particular, in particular interest. <laughs> And the biomarker is a serum level of, the, of this, these two carotenoids. Uh, 
And the two main confounders are age and smoking. So the main question was, does dietary intake of lutein and zeaxanthin protect against eye cataracts? So just to reiterate, the three methods that we looked at were logistic regression of the health outcome, eye cataracts, uh, with, um, with uh, the questionnaire and confounders, or with regression calibration and confounders, or with enhanced regression calibration and confounders. So the three methods that I've talked about so far, we applied them. But to, do, to apply them, we actually have to develop calibration equations, these prediction equations uh, relating what people report, their marker values and the confounders to what they truly eat. And to do this, one needs feeding studies. Um, feeding studies where individuals are recruited, given controlled diets for a period of several weeks usually, and the um, levels of the markers are measured both at the beginning and at the end of the study to see what is the relationship between the intake and the, and the marker. Um, we need those, and we need also some population studies of the biomarkers and the dietary instruments to get population means and standard deviations. This is all in order to create the prediction equations that I'm talking about. Well, it so happened that for lutein exanthin, we were lucky because feeding studies had been carried out. Two of them are men uh, mentioned here, and we also had several population studies, and we chose these three here as being the most relevant. So all that information was available, and without giving you the details, we took the data from these studies and we built uh, models for three different things. Firstly, for the relationship between the biomarker and the intake. That was, remember, part of what, we, uh, what I showed you before with the causal graph. So here we have a model for that, and these are log-transformed. Uh, these in intakes and uh, serum levels are all log-transformed here. Uh, and we have a second uh, measurement error. We have a measurement error model relating the questionnaire to the true intake, um, and we have a third model, which is this classical measurement error model for the marker measurement. So we have, from studies, we're able to get all of these and even to estimate the uh, variances of these error terms here. And once you have those, then it's a relatively easy matter to turn those models into prediction equations. And so here we have the prediction equations for regression calibration, where we're just using the questionnaire and the uh, confounders to predict what the true intake is. And notice that we have a value here of 0.355. I expect We'd like that to be one, uh, because uh, if uh, the questionnaire was really good, then it would mean that it was fairly close to predicted intake, but it's not so very good. Um, when we add the, uh, the biomarker to the prediction, we see a fairly high value for the biomarker. We can't tell that that's influential, because of the uh, scale of the biomarker is different from the intake. But in fact, this is a very influential part of the prediction. And you can see that this coefficient for the questionnaire now goes down because the biomarker is giving you a lot of the, a lot of the information about the predicted intake. Um, and here are the results. So let's just look firstly at the estimates of the log odds ratio. So here we have the unadjusted value, a small um, minus value. This is log odds ratio, so this is a roughly a uh, relative risk of about 0.84. Um, and when we do regression calibration, as often happens, we see that there is a, a much larger uh, estimate that we, uh, uh, that we get because we are de-attenuating. This, this, this value here is attenuated. This is a de-attenuated value. And remember from the theory, this is what we expect to be the unbiased the un, uh, estimate. And then with the enhanced regression calibration, we're getting something fairly clear, although we know that this is a biased estimate. And in fact, it will um, tend, uh, it, for these data at least, we know that it would tend to exaggerate somewhat the, uh, the, the risk. Uh, so that's the estimates. And because, we, because of the theory, we would take this as being the best estimate. Uh, 
But here now we look at the Z values for the test of the null hypothesis and we'll see no difference between the unadjusted and the regression calibration as expected because it doesn't add, regression calibration doesn't add information. But here we're seeing a Z value which is much higher than the other two, uh, indicating this, expectation, this expected um, uh, improvement in power that uh, we get from adding the information from the biomarker. And if we want to know how, excuse me, if we wanted to know how large is this um, improvement in terms of sample size, well, what we can do is compare the 1 over, 1 over z squared is proportional to the sample size required approximately. So this uh, increase in the z uh, is equivalent to about 50%, uh, actually uh, slightly larger than 50% reduction in the required sample size. So we are getting something from adding in this extra information. So our recommended strategy at the moment is when you can do this, and of course you can't always do it because you need the extra information from all these other external studies to uh, implement this, but when you can do it, to estimate the odds ratios using the, an unbiased method, which would be the regression calibration, but to test the odds ratio using the enhanced regression calibration that increases the power. And one unsolved question, I'd be happy to have, uh, if anybody would like to work with me on this, I'd be very happy to work on it, is how to form confidence intervals when you've got an estimate which is uh, unbiased but not very, not very precise and a test which is, biased, which is uh, a test which is unbiased but the estimate from it is biased so you can't use that to form the confidence interval. So um, I don't know if anybody's come up with a problem like that. So just to finish, a few considerations um, uh, related to all, uh, using this method, this approach in general. Firstly, occasionally people have tried to use this method with biomarkers that are not classical markers such as serum levels, but other things that predict um, measurement, uh, uh, that predict um, uh, uh, dietary intake. For example, body mass index predicts, predicts uh, energy intake. Um, and the question is, uh, if you do that, um, can you be sure that it's, a me that it's a mediator and therefore be able to use these methods, or maybe it's a confounder, in which, co in which case completely different methods would need be needed. So um, if there's uncertainty, then you're not on very solid ground doing this. Um, secondly, um, it has to be understood that uh, collecting and storing the biological specimens which are required to measure these biomarkers is very costly. Um, but on the other hand, there are a lot of cohort studies now which are being set up which um, include biobanks. And if they do that, they're already spending the money, so this is a very good use for, uh, for, the, uh, for the specimens that are, they're storing away. Um, a, th a third problem is um, can we measure all the important confounders? And with biomarkers, I think the, um, the possibilities of other confound, of, of confounding are greater because, uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, with dietary biomarkers, there are complex metabolic pathways which are involved, and we don't understand those completely. And so uh, we're always going to have to worry about whether or not we've included all the important confounders or not. Um, and the last thing is, to, as I mentioned earlier, do we have the necessary information to set up these prediction equations, these calibration equations? And the answer is there's relatively little information out there at the moment. Uh, we were lucky to find an example where we could do that. Uh, but there is a new study which is being conducted in Seattle in 150 women who are taking part in what I think is the largest feeding study I've ever heard of, um, where they're being fed their the diet, the usual diet that they report, they are being fed for three weeks and, uh, and a whole range of biomarkers is being measured at the beginning and the end and this could provide the information for, to be able to use this approach um, much more widely than it is at present. Thank you.